Please pray with me. Holy God, take my words and draw them into your heart so that in chasing them down, we might find ourselves in you. Amen. The season of Advent was irrevocably changed for me back in 2003. I was doing my second year divinity school site placement in our campus chapel, and we were planning our annual liturgical extravaganza Advent service. My days were filled with thinking about and playing with the symbols, smells, and sounds of Advent. Soloists, candles, tangerines, liturgical dance, handmade bulletins. I was eating, sleeping, breathing Advent. And as an MDiv student keener, I was inspired by everything and eager to learn. But here's the thing. Caught up in this liturgical theological frenzy, I still don't think I got it. I was thinking Advent, But Advent wasn't yet in my bones. It wasn't in my blood. It wasn't in my flesh. Because you see, to get Advent, you definitely need the liturgical activities and the theological ponderings with which I was engaged. You need the beauty and the light, for sure. Those things matter, but they aren't enough. To really get Advent, You need more than the beauty and the light. You need the sublime and the darkness. I was still floating, and I was about to find myself sinking. Excitedly assembling bulletins one day, I got a call from a number I didn't immediately recognize. It was from the guy who managed the bar where I used to work in Hamilton. I haven't always been a professor. I don't know if you've heard, Natalie, and I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, he said, but Svezda has cancer. We thought you should know. We don't know how long she has. Both ends of the line went quiet. Natalie, are you there? I had worked with Svezda for three years before going to div school. Z, as we used to call her, used to crack me up. While I slung pints to put myself through undergrad and save up for div school, She slung them to pay the rent and maintain her garden. We both, I like to think, were tending our own little plots of creation. So, knowing that customers would tick more if they thought it was for school, Svesda would tell them she was a student, and she would spin stories about what she was learning that week in classes. Why should students get all the advantage, she'd grin, and I admit I had to agree. In the midst of a double shift, Svezda kept us sane and balanced. Unlike a lot of the other girls on staff, she never cheated anyone out of tables or shifts. She was always ready to help when you were in the weeds. She was the first person to tell me that God might just have a feminine side, and I thought, I wonder if she's right. She was always finding love in unexpected places. She was 24, a year younger than me, and she was my friend. It took me a full day to gather myself to call her in hospital. I truly had no idea what I would say when she picked up the line, and to this day, I don't remember what I said at all. All I do remember is that Svesta was hopeful in those early days, but the weakness in her voice immediately unraveled the hopes I had that she was going to make it. There was little that the doctors could do, so she was searching something alternative, totally her way. The conversation was quick because it tired her out. I'll be home in three weeks, I said. Wait for me. And so I returned to the thinking and playing with the smells and sounds of Advent, but now I was not only thinking Advent, I was living it. 
It was in my bones. It was in my blood. I began to feel the weight of waiting. Never had I understood how much Advent is about waiting. Waiting with my spirit and my flesh. Achingly yearning, stumbling my way not toward the glorified risen Lord, but toward only a glimmer of a humble hope that this year Christ will be born. Birth and death, the bookends of this life intertwined for me in that Advent season, as waiting characterized each. And as each day of waiting made me more and more aware that Svesda wasn't going to make it, I found that the character of my waiting changed. Indeed, what I was waiting for changed. I let go of waiting for a miracle, waiting for recovery. I let go of waiting for one last meaningful conversation. She was rapidly becoming too weak for that. I let go of the chance to hug and hold her. Touch was starting to hurt her skin. My hope became small. And in that smallness, powerful. Faith like a mustard seed? What about mustering up hope like a mustard seed? Can tiny glimmers of hope move mountains too? And so this tiny mustard seed shaped hope began to illumine the weight of my waiting. And in that, my hope became located in the act of waiting itself. Then, in the midst of this fear and this hope and this active type of waiting, I found myself drawn into a new depth of theological emotion, wherein I was startled by the question that sprung from my experience. What if Christ is not born this year? You see, truly waiting instead of rushing, truly hoping instead of expecting, These postures help us see the impossibility of Christmas. God incarnate? Majesty in flesh? These images have become so tamed that we've forgotten how unimaginable they are. But the deep experience of Advent can make us pause. It can make us ask again a question that is much more logical given the suffering we encounter in this world. What if Christ isn't born this year. Would I notice? Would I care? Would my life keep ticking along with any sense of recognition? This is the amazing thing about Advent. We have a few short weeks to live deeply into an imaginary space where we can understand the prophets waiting. Will the Christ be born Oh, dear God, please let the Christ be born just one more time. Even now, Lord Jesus, come. The readings from Isaiah and Mark today are teeming with this vibrant, bodily, aching anticipation. They almost embarrass our supposedly enlightened 21st century sensibilities with their desperate pleas. We sometimes sit uncomfortably with the types of stories of sin and apocalypse we've heard read this morning. But these are the stories that carry the weight of our need, the weight of our waiting. These are the stories that shake us out of the Christmas season into the Advent season. These stories show us what it's like to want Christ as if our lives depended on him, simply because our lives do. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, says Isaiah. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Awesome things we did not expect. Christmas comes every year, December 25th. We know it. We expect it and the mountains don't tremble. But if we have this mustard seed-sized hope that we will be lucky enough to see Christ born this year, not just celebrate the fact that he was born long ago, but see it anew, it would be as though the mountains trembled. In Christ's coming, the smallest, humblest thing, 
the thing we could never expect becomes great. Isaiah is begging for God's coming, fully acknowledging there is nothing he can do to bring it. Our righteous acts are like filthy rags, he says. The wind of our sins has swept us away. Think about that image for a moment. The wind of our sins has swept us away. We tend to think of sin, when we think of it at all, as something that grips us, holds us in place. But here it's described as something sweeping us away, taking us off course, removing us from where it is we're supposed to be. The church has wielded concepts of sin in such damaging, destructive ways. I worry we've created too many overactive antibodies in response, like we're allergic now to any acknowledgement of it. But the God to whom Isaiah is pointing is the God for whom sinners long. There are no hermeneutic or homiletic gymnastics I can do to make the text say something else, at least with the passage we're looking at today. So please bear with my Baptist roots for just a moment. For Isaiah, it's only sinners who know how to say, Even now, Lord Jesus, come. For Isaiah, it's only sinners, those who see the beauty and the sublime, the light and the darkness. It's only sinners who can see the need for Christ to be born. And it's only sinners who can truly want it, who can long for it, who can have the desire to wait with hope, for awesome things we did not expect. This is surprisingly good news. Please don't hear me as conflating sin and suffering here. There are only a few similarities between my longing for Svezda and the longing of the sin-sick soul for Christ. Their abundant differences do matter, but it's the handful of things they have in common that mattered for helping me understand the nature of Advent. Both are tinged with doubt, both are tinged with hope, and both are desperate. It's only those waiting with their mustard seed-sized glimmer of hope who can entertain honestly the question, what if Christ weren't born this year? Only some blend of doubt, desperation, and hope can see the stakes of the gap between the here and the unexpected remaining unbridged. And so only some blend of doubt, desperation, and hope can say with integrity, even now, Lord Jesus, come. Mark's Jesus, in fact, sounds a lot like Isaiah in this regard. Be on guard, he says, be alert. We don't know what day the Son of Man will return. End times predictions aside, there's a message here for all of us. We cannot predict where and when the Christ will show up, where and when he'll be born, where and when he'll return and return and return to us. This posture of alert waiting that Mark describes is not unlike the posture of Advent, which simultaneously is not unlike the posture of the Christian life. We wait. We actively, hopefully wait for those moments when Christ is born and when he returns and returns and returns to us. This is what Paul is telling the Corinthians about, that we are filled with spiritual gifts as we wait for the revelation of Christ. We wait for the anticipation that in its fullness, waiting is graced. We wait, watching for signs of Christ coming around us, Indicators we trust to tell us that he might be on his way. But we wait always knowing that his arrival will be new. It will disrupt and remake us. It will grip and excite us. And we wait. We wait with the hope that we'll know it when we see it. That if he's born this year, we'll recognize him. We wait, knowing the stakes of the question, what if Christ is not born this year, hoping beyond hope that he will be? Here's the good news. 
At the end of that Advent back in 2003, Christ was born, at least for me. But I'm not going to say just like he'll be born this 2011, because it's only November, and we just don't know yet. I made it home in time. I rushed to the hospital. I burst into Svezda's room, looking confusedly at the old woman sitting in there, assumed I had the wrong room, and walked straight back out. No, the nurse told me, that's her. That's your friend. Svezda's beautiful, beautiful body, her shining face and glorious hair, had, of course, all withered away. And I had not prepared for the shock. I didn't know how to recognize her. She couldn't speak, could hardly move, and from her tiny frame protruded a giant belly, pregnant and fit to burst with the cancer that was taking her from us. I tried to wipe the shock from my face and took the seat in front of her, a seat that was now often vacant, because who wants to think about a dying 24-year-old at Christmas time? You can hold her hand, her mother told me, tell her stories. She'd love to hear what's going on in your life. It felt ridiculous, but I told her everything I could think of. My classes, my new friends, the busyness of life. I told her that Div School was teaching me what she had taught me years ago, that God might just have a feminine side. And all the while I was speaking, I kept thinking, this isn't her. I have the wrong person. What if I'm telling my stories to a stranger? Why can't I see her? And then for just a second, she lifted her head and opened her eyes. She looked straight into mine, and there she was, clear as day, there was Z. No grand miracle, no recovery, no great conversation to say goodbye and wrap up a friendship neatly. Things that had been unsaid remained unsaid. But the thing I'd been waiting for without knowing it was so simple and so humble and in that so great that the mountains trembled and God came down. I don't even know if I was on guard for it, as Mark would have me be. I like to think that it was God herself who helped me be alert, because had I not been alert, I might have missed it. What amazes me to this day about that moment when I experienced a birth in the midst of death and the mountainous tremble, what amazes me to this day is that the thing it turned out I was waiting, hoping, and yearning for was simply the chance to look one more time in my friend's eyes and to recognize her beyond recognition. And maybe, just maybe, to have her recognize me. You know the ending. There's only one way this turns out. Her body shrunk and her belly grew, and she died a few days later. In 2003, Christmas was utterly surrounded by death, with only a tiny glimmer of birth for me. Even so, in that moment, in Svezda's eyes, I saw her truly, and in that I saw God. Good news is most often hard news. For beauty to resonate, it must dig deep into the sublime. Light shines most brightly in the midst of the most suffocating darkness. Stories of birth compel us most when they become our last stand against the deep and abiding power of death. So will Jesus Christ be born this year? I admit, I don't know. Many days I, have, I struggle to have faith that he will be. Most days I forget to even ask the question. And then there are the days with the glimmers of hope. And those are the days when I remember that we've got a few short weeks to get ourselves into this posture of waiting. Waiting with that bodily, achy hope for this unexpected birth. I can't know what it is in your life that's going to help you get there, but I'm going to invite you there nonetheless into a time of silence where we'll try together to find it.
find the place where the prophets stood and then stand there. Let Jesus' words of return fill you and then overflow. Find a way to make these strange stories make sense. And only once you've found that place of deep waiting, only then have the courage to say, even now, Lord Jesus, come. Please pray with me. God of birth and death, of the beauty and the sublime, of the light and the darkness, we come before you hoping to find a way to pause, to sink into the posture of waiting. In these moments of silence, teach us how to get there, please. Let those of us who are ready to wait say these words together. Even now, Lord Jesus, come. Even now, Lord Jesus, come.